Good evening and welcome to this evening's presentation of Iron Government, a production of the Agency for Public Information. I'm Sheridan Lewis. This evening, the cannabis industry in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is on a path to exponential growth and promise as this country welcomes exportation announcement. The API speaks with Chief Medical Officer on the latest COVID-19 information. And the Ministry of Transport, Works, Land Surveys and Physical Planning prepare for a busy year of work. These stories are ahead, but first let's join the API's Yinka Chambers at the News Desk for Newswatch. Good evening and welcome to News Watch. I am Yinka Chambers. The government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines continues to honor its commitment to ensuring that students who perform exceptionally well at the Caribbean Advanced Proficiency Exams CAPE and associate degree programs offered at the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Community College are able to further their education. Speaking on NBC Radio on Wednesday, January 5th, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez announced that this year, 61 students have received awards. Speaking on NBC Radio on Wednesday, January 5th, Prime Minister Dr. Ralph Gonzalez announced that this year, 61 persons have received awards. The awards, he said, were made on the basis of recommendations of education officials presented by Minister of Education Curtis King in a cabinet memorandum on Wednesday, December 29th. The awards distributed are as follows. From the CAPE program, seven national scholarships were awarded to Adaya Holder, Dequalani Simmons, Elias Jr. Williams, Donicia Charles, Tiana Roberts, Shani Warakan, Ashanti Williams, and 15 national exhibitions and five bursaries. From the Associate Degree Program, one National Exhibition Award was presented to Miss Desita Lewis. Two special awards tenable for three years were awarded to Floricia Wiley and Francisca Alexander Holder, valued at the National Exhibition level, and 30 bursaries. Prime Minister Gonzalves noted that the same number of awards was presented to candidates in 2020 and that the government does not compromise on the education of the nation's youth. We still do not compromise on the education of our young people. I want that point to sink in. It's easy for us to say, well, it's a, t it's a difficult time. We can't give these scholarships this year, we can't give these bursaries, or we only give one or two. Because well, last year, we also gave 61, you know. I'm talking about for, for, 2020, for 2020, and for 2021, we have given another 61. The numbers vary in terms of bursaries, uh, national scholarships, uh, national exhibitions. The reason why for the CAPE students, in terms of the, the special awards, because these are students, the special awards go to the three to top students in the associate degree, but one of them is 30 years old, and one is 37, and a third one is 26. But to get a national scholarship or a national exhibition, you can't be more than 21. There's a age limit to it. You see what I mean? But if you do well, because we have the associate degree program, we have to give you a special award. None of them, of course, has risen to the level of the comparable level for a national scholarship. The Ministry of National Mobilization and Social Development will be facilitating the registration of persons in the North Leeward, North Windward, and North Central Windward zones who did not receive any assistance through the Volcano Support Grant, which was run by the World Food Program, the WFP, and who now wishes to do so. This process started on Wednesday, January 5th, and will run through to January 14th. Persons in North Leeward can visit the Town Board office located behind the Trimaka Government School from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. daily. For persons in North Windward and North Central Windward zones, registration is being done at the Georgetown Community Center. 
Persons are reminded that when conducting the transaction that you provide a working telephone number and bring along your identification card. All COVID-19 protocols will be in full effect. The Birmingham 2022 Queen's Baton Relay will arrive in St. Vincent and the Grenadines on May 19th and will remain in the country for two days. It will spend two months traveling around the Caribbean and the Americas. While the baton is in each country, there will be activities hosted to showcase young persons, the baton bearers, and athletes that are endeavoring to create changes in their communities. There will also be a showcase of a project that tackles one of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. The Queen and Prince Edward, Earl of Wessex, launched the 16th official Queen's Baton Relay at Buckingham Palace on October 12, 2021. The 16th official Queen's Baton Relay is an epic journey across the Commonwealth, with the Queen's Baton visiting all 72 nations and territories, reaching Europe, Africa, Asia, Oceania, the Caribbean, and the Americas. The baton relay will conclude after 269 days when the final baton bearer will return the baton to Her Majesty the Queen. The St. Vincent and the Grenadines Indian Heritage Foundation welcomed the new High Commissioner of India to SVG, His Excellency Mr. Shankar Balkarandran, and his spouse on their first official visit to St. Vincent and the Grenadines. The official visit lasted from Tuesday, December 28, 2021 to Wednesday, January 5, 2022. During his visit, the High Commissioner presented his credentials to Governor General Her Excellency Dame Susan Duggan at Government House and met with Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Rav Gonzales at the Office of the Prime Minister. He also toured the Red Zones with Minister of Agriculture Sabota Caesar, traveled to the Grenadine Island of Beque where he called on Dr. Godwin Friday, Parliamentary Representative for the Northern Grenadines. He also met with two deans of the Trinity and St. James Medical Universities, followed by a community meeting at Calder with the membership of the Foundation, where areas of cooperation between the Embassy and the Foundation were discussed in the presence of Minister of the Public Service and Parliamentary Representative for South Leeward, the Honorable Frederick Stevenson. The High Commissioner toured several facilities in the North Leeward District with Minister of Tourism and Area Representative, the Honorable Carlos James. The High Commissioner and his spouse left SVG on Wednesday, January 5th. Honorary Counsel for India to SVG, Junior Bacchus, accompanied the Commissioner on all his visits during his week-long stay. This has been Newswatch. Thank you for staying with us. I am Yinka Chambers. Diabetes is among the top three leading causes of death. Are you living with diabetes? If so, you may be at risk for developing complications, especially during this COVID pandemic. Let's tackle this problem by complying with taking your medication, increasing your physical activities, increasing eating a balanced and nutritious diet, checking your feet as foot care is important, and contacting your healthcare provider. Remember, diabetes can lead to blindness, amputation, and numerous harmful and life-threatening effects. Protect yourself. Know your numbers. Hearts Movement SVG reminds you to love your body and treat it right. Your health is shared responsibility. Welcome back. This country is on the cusp of a breakthrough in the medicinal cannabis industry. The announcement was made at a press briefing held today at Invest SVG. The API's Balvin Oliver has more. History has been made in the area of cannabis exports. That's according to the CEO of the SVG Medicinal Cannabis Authority, 
as it was revealed that Cabinet has approved the first cannabis export license. This step allows a licensee, which is a local manufacturing company, to begin exports of cannabis products. Given some details on the historic moment was CEO of the SVG Cannabis Authority, Dr. Gerald Thompson, who said this is the first of many milestones. This first export license, I would say it's the first in the OECS, and this has set the stage for the final steps before a date of shipment can be properly arranged. Of the many milestones in the, this journey, I want to highlight, of course, other milestones, the, the granting and award of licenses under the Medicinal Cannabis Industry Act. B, the global uh, model for the inclusion of traditional cultivators, ensuring that they are part of this process. C, patient access regulations, the first in the Caribbean. D, dispensary pharmacies established here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And the availability of a wide range of locally produced and manufactured medicinal cannabis products for patients. But in addition, the ability of visiting patients who are suitably qualified to obtain such products with prescription. F, the medicinal cannabis, um, uh, um, cannabis authorities' capacity and its experience in conducting what is now known as good agricultural and collection practices, GACP standards, and the extensive training of all licensees in GACP, including the traditional cultivators, so as to lift the quality of cannabis product we produce even higher. And then H, the construction and full operationalization of the state-of-the-art laboratory testing facility at Enums. And really, this, this, I would say, is an achievement that we have been particularly proud of. And this is one of the, the first. And we hope that this is also going to have a far greater reach. We consider it to be a passport for export, the tests that are um, available there. And G, obtaining confirmed national estimates from what's known as the International Narcotics Control Board. I don't think many persons still realize that globally, cannabis is under the control as a narcotic. Major efforts has been made, I would say, to try and deregulate, and you would have heard this in a number of countries, but still internationally, there are these restrictions that St. Vincent and the Grenadines must still adhere to. And we have been navigating the whole process so as to be compliant, because to be compliant means that you are also able to trade and to export. And of course, what I would have mentioned in terms of obtaining that import license and now cabinet's approval of an export license. I imagine that the company that has received this export authorization and license now is going to be moving very swiftly to consummate our first export and that this is going to go a long way, that as this process is repeated, that St. Vincent is going to be considered not only a global player with this new industry, but one that is producing some of the highest quality product that has the ability to be tested and shown to be of high quality, and that the services that are going to be um, uh, available for patients, both home and wherever that cannabis is exported to, that people will be truly satisfied with 
what we consider is a true Vincentian product. Also recognizing this historic moment was Minister of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, the Honorable Subota Caesar. He said this first step creates a tremendous opportunity not just to deliver quality products, but also to work with other cannabis produced in OECS countries. The MCA has done an excellent job. And when the history books are written and uh, students of history canvas an analysis of this period, it will reflect that on January the 5th, 2022, that the cabinet of St. Vincent and the Grenadines made a very important decision to issue the first export license for cannabis. And that is not only in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but within the sub-region, it is the first in the OECS. And I want to make a call to the other member states of the OECS who already have embarked on a path to establish a cannabis industry and industries in the islands that we see a clear opportunity for us to work together. We have been blessed in St. Vincent and the Grenadines to have the traditional cultivators who assisted us in ensuring that the framework that was established is an excellent one. And in this SVG, working with the MCA, we have been able to attract investors locally, regionally, and internationally. And because of the hard work of several teams working together, we were able to bring to our shores a state-of-the-art, world-class lab, gold standards, and uh, the investors who have entered into a joint venture relationship with the Medicinal Cannabis Authority, they are now able to sell their services, not only to the stakeholders in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but other member states of the OECS and CARICOM in need of these lab services to be able to, to export, they can come to St. Vincent and the Grenadines and send the product here to be tested. The establishment of the political will was one. Setting the legislative framework is very important. But bringing the factors of production together in a period of a pandemic definitely took a lot of work. And I want to recognize all of the stakeholders in the cannabis industry. You continue to choose St. Vincent and the Grenadines as the, the jurisdiction for your investment and uh, the hard work of Invest SVG definitely is making your work easier. I want to wish the public sector participants in the industry all the very best as we move forward and to state clearly that the government of St. Vincent and the Grenadines will continue to work with the private sector stakeholders to ensure that we are able to move product, not only within the jurisdiction, but that we are able to export from St. Vincent and the Grenadines the best product in the marketplace globally. Thank you very much. 
Meanwhile, Executive Director of Invest SVG, Annette Mark, said the local company has already made tremendous investments, both in capital and experience, and believes their involvement in the industry will be an asset. Mark gave the assurance that Invest SVG will continue to do its part to attract investors to the industry. I must say too, um, working closely with them that I have recognized within the company, there are some bright stars, there are some young people within that company, very professional, and they have brought to the industry, they have, their level of knowledge have lifted the industry and have definitely helped us where we are sitting here because it is new to us all. And I know that even the Medicinal Cannabis Authority have benefited from their knowledge. It's a learning experience for all of us, but we are learning together. I know at some point in time, i sorry, I know the minister. Minister, I know this is a proud moment for you. Mm. <laughs> You've put a lot, we of all, <laughs> and you in particular, have put some long hours into this industry. I mean, I remember our times when we were doing the legislation itself, receiving calls, messages, and whatever, at all hours of the night from the minister. Uh, so I know he has been working round the clock, even after. And of course, the Medicinal Cannabis Authority itself, they ha I have to say, they are a shining example. They have done so much. They have gone so far. They've been able to build a laboratory, which we, which I know is going to benefit not just St. Vincent, but the region as a whole. So I think they have really made steps, leaps and bounds, given our setbacks, given COVID, given everything else. And of course, Terrell Map. how can I forget Terrell, has been there working assisting, supporting, and we at Invest SVG are very happy that to have been part of this process, been, been part of this journey and being here today. Like I said, we have a long way to go, but one thing we have seen is that working together, what we can achieve, even in the, even in the face of adversities. And I want to thank everyone who has been there and supported us. The minister, we got a long way to go, but I know we're going to get there. And Gerald and Terrell, thank you all for your support. And now it's a pleasure working with you. Ezra and, and, and um, Spirit, uh, been there from the beginning also. And like I said, I'm so happy to be here today to say that we are now at this point where we can export. After all that hard work, but it's only a drop in the bucket. We will continue to facilitate investors. We will continue to work with the minister and with the MCA. There are opportunities within the sector. Reporting for the API, I am Barbara Oliver. Coming up, we'll learn more about the latest COVID-19 information here. Stay with us. Stop the spread of viral infections, including the flu and COVID-19, by practicing proper hand washing. Follow these simple steps. Remove all jewelry before washing hands. Wet hands using running water. Place liquid soap in hand. Circulate using rotational movements, interlace fingers, and repeat switching hands. Wash back of fingers, rotating them in the palms. Wash fingertips, rotating them in palms. Wash thumbs using rotational movements. Thoroughly wash hands down to the wrist. Rinse hands. Dry with clean tissue. Turn off tap using tissue. Use tissue to open door and discard in bin. A simple act can make a huge difference. Stop the spread of viral infections, including the flu and COVID-19, by practicing proper hand washing. This is a message from the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment. Thanks for staying with us. 
In the following interview, Chief Medical Officer Dr. Simon Kisa Beach discloses the Ministry of Health, Wellness and the Environment's latest activities and plans in the fight against COVID-19. More on this in the following interview with the API's Hala John. Welcome again to the API's presentation. I'm here with Chief Medical Officer Dr. Simone Kiza Beach to bring the nation up to speed on the current COVID situation. Welcome and Happy New Year, Dr. Happy New Beach. Year to you too and thanks for coming. Wonderful. We're just coming off of the Christmas and New Year's season. Um, today, I want to establish it at the outset, is January 6th. Because the situation is very fluid yes. and things are constantly changing, I feel the need to establish that because what we say here might not necessarily carry through for the day. That's true. Where are we right now with regards to COVID and the deaths and the more important statistics like hospitalizations and so on? Okay, so as of this morning, um, the 6th of January 2022, we have 6,242 reported cases, and these are cases, um, PCR tested cases at our lab. Um, so that figure does not include the many persons who have done antigen tests, whether at our clinics or at the private facility or even at home. So let's keep that in mind. Right. So we are at 6,242 as of this morning. Of those persons on our books, we have 806 persons being active. However, that figure includes persons who would have cleared already. So we have to do some confirmation that we have cleared them because those would be persons in November. So those persons have cleared because our system is by 14 days, you have cleared unless you have long COVID or something else is going on. But officially on the books, as this morning, before we do that clearing, we have 806 active cases of COVID in St. Vincent, meaning not cleared. Um, and an extremely important is that as of this morning, um, we still have in terms of reported deaths, 83. But I would say that overnight, we have had two deaths at the Milton Cato Memorial Hospital in one of our COVID observation areas, um, which we are still trying to determine exactly cause of death and to, to yes, cause of death and the proper notification. So by the end of today, we might be at 84 and probably 85, all right? Um, and also important, between Monday and Tuesday, we had an additional 203 PCR positives. So we can safely say, sadly, that we are square in the middle of our third spike. Our first spike was December, January, December 2020 into January, February 2021. Our second spike was September into October 2021. We settled a bit into November and early December, and we are back full into our third spike. And the, what we must acknowledge is even though as of today, we have only had one laboratory confirmation of an Omicron patient in St. Vincent, somebody positive with the Omicron variant of the virus, and that was from CAFA. The way we are seeing in terms of the replication, so one person and then more than five persons around being positive and the exponential increase in cases, right. we are pretty confident that Omicron is circulating rapidly within our population. Wow. All right. So just, and, and also, I know there's also been a lot of talk about the Omnicom and that the vaccines are no longer. And, yes, you know, a lot have, of talk about that. Right. But still, still, remember, we started out with a lot of these vaccines having efficacy levels 
over 75, over 85, into the 90s. Right. Normally, for any vaccine, you, all you need is something over 50 because it means that if I take this vaccine, I have a more than 50% chance of not getting as sick, of not dying, of, you know. Right. So that when you start to talk about vaccines, and I'm not sure if you remember when these things came out, it was like, my Lord, this is really, in, you know, a lot. Mm -hmm. Because these are extremely high levels. So it's almost as if you started out very high. And yes, you are battling the Omicron and the Delta and all of those things. But you're still at a very good efficacy, very good effectiveness level. At a level where if you take this vaccine, you are still less likely than an unvaccinated person. You are still less likely to be infected. And if you are infected, you are still less likely to become very sick. You're still less likely to um, have to be admitted to hospital. And you are still less likely to die. Okay? And you said as at today, we have had 83 recorded deaths. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you. Mm -hmm. Are any of these deaths at present identified to be those of vaccinated, fully vaccinated persons? No. So as of those 83, as of those 83, we had one person who had received one dose of a vaccine a few days before they died. Right. So as of that 83 figure, we have had nobody dying who was fully vaccinated. Um, However, mm -hmm. as I said, we are currently investigating two deaths that took place in the next last 24 hours. And one of those persons is a fully vaccinated person. Okay. So that by later today, we would know for sure if that is the case, and that would be our first person who has died from COVID who was fully vaccinated. That said, the statistics you would have for sure to say the person, okay, had these comorbidities mm -hmm. and therefore was, even though the vaccine helped, it would have taken them down a little, or it would have affected them more if they had like, serious comorbidities or maybe age being a factor mm -hmm. or obesity being mm -hmm. a factor. Mm -hmm. Is it likely for the your, your the health department, health Ministry of Health to bring out this specific information when it becomes available even for the person who's fully vaccinated? If you would also identify that this person had XYZ contributing to so, right. their debt, are you going to specifically so bring that out? as we always done, huh? as, if you notice, whenever we, if, if somebody dies from COVID, we would say person had comorbidities. We always say that. We might not necessarily say the person had specifically um, sickle cell disease or um, kidney failure, we would say comorbidities. Right. Why? Because from the beginning, and we've always gotten pressure for this, St. Vincent is a very small country. Yes. And we still have to always, COVID, healthcare, patient confidentiality, patient information is extremely important. Privacy is extremely important to us, despite what people say. Okay, and which is why I find it, just as an aside, I find it very interesting that we who, they say we um, let out everybody's information, but we are still able to hide that we have COVID deaths. No, how does that, how does that right, look, vaccine right. deaths? If we can hide, <laughs> if we can keep something quiet, how are we keeping that quiet? Anyway, let me get back. <laughs> so, the, um, we always state whether the person has comorbidities, their age, we also try to see if the person was ill for a while or the period between diagnosis right, and death. Right. Given us a, given given the public as much information as we can while still um, observing some privacy for the patient and the right, family. Right. Um the so I could say that according to our existing the, the information we have so far. For this particular case, if it comes out that 
it really is a fully vaccinated person. This particular case, again, is someone who has comorbidities, who had comorbidities, and um, so that, as we said, the vaccines decrease the likelihood. Mm -hmm. There's no 100%. Right. A lot of people are saying, because they're not preventing um, illness or death 100%, they're no good. No, no, no. They decrease. Right. And so we have been able to, we have had 83 persons dying from COVID. None of those persons was fully vaccinated, as in having had both doses and passing two weeks after the vaccination. Okay. If we have this case is confirmed, it will be the first case. And it is somebody who is over 50. It is somebody who has comorbidities. And sadly, and this is what we are trying to avoid, is that the person apparently was ill for more than five days, but presented to us one day yesterday and died on the same day. Oh. Within 24 hours. So, and that's another thing. So you said mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. what would somebody do? Mm -hmm. So we are urging persons because sadly, persons are afraid to come to us. Right. Um, they feel that, you know, it's not going to be a good outcome if they come to us, but we are urging persons, as we have done for dengue and everything else, seek healthcare early because what we also know yes we have omicron but we still have delta we still have lambda we still have those things which can go very quickly from i'm feeling okay to i'm not okay and um also with that said um there's also emphasis now on taking the boosters oh, very so. and even if what i mean my natural curiosity would be okay was this person fully vaccinated six months ago and should they have taken a booster to help to bolster yes. their their um yeah. their ability to fight the disease so, so so if it is that this is this is confirmed the information thus far does say that this person did have their vaccine more than six months ago and so um and that's the thing about this whole horrible pandemic. Persons are saying, oh, you need to take a booster. So that means the vaccines are not good. No, no, no. I know of one person who was vaccinated, had COVID in October, October, and is positive today. Positive today. October is... 10 months to two, two months ago. So they're not this thing about natural immunity. Right. It's right. so inconsistent. Right. I might have COVID and my natural immunity takes me six, seven, 12 months. You might have COVID and your natural immunity did not last for one month. Wow. Granted, the person has a very mild case right now mm -hmm. compared with their previous one. But it's just to say that, you know, some people say, oh, I'll just wait and get it and I'll be fine. Or I had COVID, so I don't need to be vaccinated. Because, you know, our policy here is you get COVID, you get, you're ready to be vaccinated one month down. Huh? Other countries are still doing three months and so on. But we were saying this because of what we were seeing. We were seeing persons who had COVID in the December, January spike and coming down with COVID again. So therefore, we pushed up. You see, you, you have to do it according to what you are seeing in your context, in your population. Right? So, yes, boosting is extremely important. As I said, we looked at the figures of persons who were, become, who were positive cases, vaccinated, and we saw the gradual increase in breakthrough infections as we came down to the end of the year. Why? Because these people are coming up to their six months or even their eight months, because Pfizer is six months. Right. Sputnik and AstraZeneca, they are eight months, right? Okay. And Pfizer, they just announced they could they even say in five months. So five to six months of Pfizer, Sputnik, AstraZeneca, we're talking about Sputnik V, so two doses, or AstraZeneca, eight months. If you had Sputnik Light, we're going to ask you to get a booster at three months. Okay, so each vaccine has a booster right now and they are available? So the boosters are centers? the same vaccines, huh? It's just the same vaccine? It's the same vaccine. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Most, so you can so just us, top up? Just top up. 
Okay. Right? So you, you're just giving yourself a little boost. So, for example, your tetanus. Right. When you have tetanus and you come for your tetanus booster 10 years down, there's just another tetanus dose. Okay. Okay. That's what the booster is. It's just like a nudge you into remembering your system into remember this is right. what it is. Right. And of course, the fact is, if you've had it for six months and you've gone fine, why not just take it again? Right. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, we have had, um, generally speaking, very few severe reactions. Um, we have one, one case now that we are looking at. Um, and then there was another case before where somebody had a serious pre-existing condition, decided they were going to take the vaccine because COVID on their condition would have been much worse. And they had the expected um, flare up of that condition and they worked through. But if you think about it, we have given 60, over 60,000 doses of vaccine. Right. Right. So if you are, and it might sound harsh for the individuals, but if you look at the country as a whole, if we are able to give 60 something thousand doses of vaccines and you divide it by 30,000 persons and we come up with two persons who have had um, significant side effects, we have to look at the bigger. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. yeah. Significant work is expected to take place this year by the Ministry of Transport, Works, Land Surveys and Physical Planning. More on this after the break. The hurricane season is upon us, and as we know, hurricanes can be dangerous. Listening to the hurricane warning messages and planning ahead can reduce the chances of injury or major property damage. Before a storm or hurricane hits, get to know your emergency shelters Contact Nemo for the closest shelter to you. Have disaster supplies on hand, flashlight and extra batteries, portable battery operated radio and extra batteries, first aid kit, non-perishable canned food and water, non-electric can opener, essential medicines, cash and credit cards, and sturdy shoes and raincoats. Where possible, apply hurricane roof straps. Review your insurance policy and ensure you have adequate coverage. Do not take chances with your life and property. Be hurricane ready today. A message from the Agency for Public Information and this station. Let us unite and do the thing right. My name is Ruth Stevens and I've taken the vaccine. I believe in the science because I came close to losing my son. My son, who is about 40, luckily, he was only there for about a week and he was dismissed from the hospital. In addition to that, one of our guests, Garifuna, my neighbor back in the United States, who was here three years ago, he lost his life because he got the COVID and was taken to the hospital and his wife hadn't seen him again. He was buried and they are yet to have a memorial for him. But looking at what's happening in today's society, we need to take the vaccination because all of us, we are vulnerable to this disease. Yes, there are some questions that we have, but if we take sick and we go to the hospital, we may not be able to survive this virus. So take the vaccination and let's all survive together. Vaccinate if you want to eliminate the spread of the virus. Welcome back. The sum of over $127 million has been allocated to the Ministry of Transport, Works, Land Surveys and Physical Planning for the 2022 fiscal year. This was disclosed by Portfolio Minister Montgomery Daniel during his contribution to the debate of estimates of revenue and expenditure for the 2022 fiscal year at the last sitting of Parliament. Daniel said his ministry will be carrying out significant work for this year. Some of the work include the relocation of the concrete and asphalt plant in Argyle, the Volcano Relief and Reconstruction Program, and the Feeder Road Improvement Program. We now bring you an excerpt of Minister Daniel's contribution to the debate of estimates of revenue and expenditure for the 2022 fiscal year. Madam Speaker, 
for this year 2022. What is happening? That the Ministry of Transport and Works, Lands and Surveys and Physical Planning, is given in its recurrent expenditure $32,427,374 as against a capital expenditure of $94,842,314, a grand sum of $127,269,688. Madam Speaker, the Ministry of Transport and Works has always been one of those ministries with large expenditures. And much is expected of it for this year, 2022, because of the enormous amount of works that are projected for 2022. And I want to commend the Minister and the Ministry of Finance for giving us six new positions under policy planning and, and administration, where we would have five new school bus drivers and one other driver for the electrical inspectorate. Although we need a little bit more than five school bus drivers, but we are satisfied that we can fill that gap with five new drivers at this time. On the engineering and project management services, we actually got three positions. Two engineers, one electrical and one mechanical, and one senior engineering assistant. And we are grateful for these positions because there's a lot of work to be done in relation to the physical infrastructure that is required at this time. We really want to strengthen the engineering department to carry out the increase in the workload that is before us. Madam Speaker, there are basically six new programs identified for the ministry for the year 2022. There is under subaccount number 552206, the construction of a shedding facility at a cost of some $500,000, of course. Madam Speaker, this is a project that is long awaited in that we will be able to dispose of the growing number of tires that has been thrown across all St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We also we are grateful on the sub account number 552205 that a sum of $1 million have been allocated to the reallocation or that's the relocation of the concrete and asphalt plant that is at Argyle since the completion of the AIA, Madam Speaker. We have to relo relocate those, those structures, and uh, we have the monies to do it this year. There is also, Madam Speaker, on the 552, sub account number 552203, a sum of $2 million allocated for the improved access road at the beach resort Bookament. Of course, Madam Speaker, the government is partnering with Sandals for a new hotel on that site, and so we want to make sure that the access is improved. There is also, on the sub account 552202, Grenadines Road Rehabilitation, there's a sum of $500,000 there allocated for consultancy study for the upgrade, upgrade of the road network in Beckway, Canawan. Union Island and Mayo. This is very important, I believe, to the opposition leader and the member for the Southern Grenadines. But, Madam Speaker, there are a number of other programs that is slated for 
for this ministry, and I really can't go through all of them because of the, the time that I do have. But I can make reference to one or two of the larger items, like 552108, where $1.284 million would have been allocated as counterpart funding to the CDB's funds of some $8.4 million for the Volcano Recovery and Reconstruction Program. This will be a continuation of that program to which Braxa would have been involved in the removal of ash and the cleaning of debris from rivers and drains and all of the other areas that where such debris would have been deposited. Under subaccount 552007, the Road Rehabilitation and Repair Program, the normal repair program that is being done by Braxa, that will be done as well for this year. There is the, under program 551911, the 11th EDF Feeder Road Improvement Program. That again, the sum of $1 million was allocated as counterpart funding with another $8, point, another $8 million for the recruitment of staff Procure, procure equipment, finalize, finalize designs, and commence construction for number of feeder roads, including Palmas, Vervine, Danjard, and Fenton Green Hill area. And I know that the Minister of Education will be happy to have the Fenton Road done in his constituency. There is also the Sandy Bay Defense Resilient Project, Madam Speaker, where a sum of $746,800 was allocated as counterpart funding to the CDB's $2.758 million to complete the designs, establish a project implement implementation unit, and to begin construction closer to the end of the year. Madam Speaker, it is quite some time that this project is being sought for the Northeast, is really affected tremendously by the North, Northeast waves that is coming on, on that side, and it is eroding that area. Almost every year, you're losing land in that area. There's also the PAVE project, Madam Speaker, where another $2.5 million is allocated. There is also, under the NAT 551801, Natural Disaster Management and Risk Reduction and Climate Change Adaptation Project. Again, a sum of $1 million was allocated as counterpart funding to the CDB's $12 million. And work will be seen in the Union River Defense, Union River Bridge, Chapman's Road, Maroon Hill Road, retention payment for the Langley Park Feeder Road, Union River Works, and Yambu Tiviot is also seeing some work there. There are some 23 roads, basically, 11 in the first phase, 12 in the second phase. All of these roads are scheduled to be done by the end of the year. And therefore, the Ministry of Transport and Works will be working with KDLA contractor this year, uh, 2022, to ensure that the work go on schedule. Madam Speaker, there are many more projects, some of a smaller kind, like $3.3 .3 million for the construction of the Mesopotamia Community Center, Fort Charlotte Bridge, VG Highway, all of these, they are in the budget. And we're looking forward to having these works done for this year. 
The public is asked to take note of the following announcement. All persons who qualify to be registered as voters and therefore as holders of the National Identity Card are asked to visit the registering officer at the undermentioned venues in their constituency. Registration takes place between 3.30 p.m. and 5.30 p.m. Those persons desirous of being registered must take along their birth certificates, marriage and or citizenship certificates along with a photocopy where necessary as well as NIS cards. Monday 10th and Wednesday 12th, North Windward, Sandy Bay Learning Resource Center. South Central Windward, Diamond Government School. South Windward, Stubbs Government School. Maraqua, Maraqua Government School. East St. George, Caliquatung Hall. West St. George, Belair Government School. East Kingstown, CW Prescott Primary School. Central Kingstown, Police Ban Room, Lago Height. West Kingstown, Public Health Building, Rose Place, South Leeward, Kittles Learning Resource Center, Central Leeward, Barrelly Government School, North Leeward, Spring Village Police Station, North Central Windward, Monday 10th, Georgetown Government School, Wednesday 12th, Park Hill Government School, Beckway, Friendly Society Hall, Port Elizabeth, Union Island, Social Welfare Office, Clifton, and Cano One, Canawan Administrative Building. The public is hereby advised that the electoral office is attempting to register all elderly and or incapacitated persons at their homes. Please inform the registering officer of persons needing this service. For more information, you can visit our Facebook page at API SVG. This is where we end this evening's Iron Government presentation, a program produced and presented by the Agency for Public Information. Join us again on Saturday at 5 p.m. for Inside Story. For recaps and further updates, visit our social media platforms at API SVG or www.apisvg.gov.vc. On behalf of the production team, thank you for viewing. I'm Sheridan Lewis. Good night.